Hello everyone, and welcome to the last of our mini lectures for the Modern European History course. We end our course with a lecture on Brexit, which, alongside the 2008 financial crash, the Russian annexation of the Crimea, the refugee crisis, and now Covid, was one of the defining events of contemporary Europe. A quick note on terms, as I'm not sure we ever went through this in detail. The United Kingdom, or UK, is the name of the country we are discussing today, but, much like Spain, the UK is made up of a number of different, smaller countries, which, since 1997, have had their own parliaments under a process known as devolution. There is Wales, which was conquered by the King of England in the 13th century, Scotland, which was cajoled into uniting with England in 1707, and Northern Ireland, which, as we have seen, was created in the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921. Most of Ireland is an independent country of its own, under the name of the Republic of Ireland, having won its freedom from the UK in an independence war. Lastly, there is England itself, which has no parliament of its own, but which hosts the United Kingdom's parliament in its traditional capital, London. The geographic name for the islands that the UK is located in is the British Isles, and the largest of the islands is known as Great Britain. Great Britain was not always an island, but was once attached to continental Europe, by a flat stretch of land known as Doggerland. This land was populated by thousands of people when, in a climate disaster less than 10,000 years ago, it slipped below the waves of the North Sea. From then on, whilst the British Isles remained a part of Europe, their geographical isolation allowed for a slightly different historical development. Of course, a great deal of contact between the tribes now stuck on the island and the tribes of continental northwest Europe remained. Trade proliferated between the two, and groups of adventurers from Europe would occasionally cross the sea to forge new homes in Great Britain. The Romans conquered today's England and Wales in the first century of the Common Era. The Roman Empire also conquered half of Scotland before being forced to retreat, and it left no permanent presence whatsoever in Ireland. Being part of the Roman Empire drew England and Wales into a wider European network, with shared institutions and a shared language, Latin. The province of Britannia grew wealthy from trade with the rest of the continent, while settlers from as far away as Egypt came to Britain to live and to work. Still, Britannia always remained a wet and relatively isolated corner of the empire far from the power centre in Italy. It was thus abandoned in the early 5th century, its inhabitants frequently targeted by raiders from Ireland, Scotland and Denmark. The great Roman cities and villas fell into disrepair and small kingdoms took the place of the empire. The following centuries saw Germanic invaders, the Angles and the Saxons, conquer most of modern England, displacing the previous Romano-Britons, who fled west and gradually became the Welsh. Anglo-Saxon England was fairly isolated from the developments on the continent, but it did come to embrace Christianity, with monks from both Christian Ireland and Rome both attempting to convert the country. In the end, the Roman priests won this struggle, and Britain was placed under the wider network of the papacy. The Vikings, who conquered much of England, Ireland, Scotland in the 9th century, also linked the people of Britain to countries outside of their borders. In the end, it was a group of Vikings who settled in France, known as the Normans, who conquered England for good. The modern English language is a combination of Latin, the Germanic Old English, and the French spoken by England's new Norman overlords. English identity remained stifled in the subsequent centru centuries by the fact that the nobility continued to speak French and look to the continent for cultural inspiration, whilst the church conducted services in Latin, 
and look to Rome. The kings of England often spent more time in France than in England itself. An important event did occur during the reign of King John, who was forced to sign over rights to the nobility in the so-called Magna Carta, in return for their support. Whilst the nobility were certainly not English patriots, over time Magna Carta was to morph into the basis of the so-called right of English liberty. It was only England's defeat in the Hundred Years' War that, ironically, saw the beginning of a uniquely English identity. The abandonment of the monarchy's dreams of the French crown saw it embrace the holdings that it did possess in England. Meanwhile, the nobility had started speaking in English instead of in French, especially once they lost their castles and their villages on the continent. The famous Tudor dynasty were notable for their Welsh origins and for the fact that they helped us to accelerate this process of English separation from wider European trends. In particular, King Henry VIII's decision to pull out of the Catholic Church and to found his own national or Anglican Church was a key factor in distancing his, in distancing his country. England's Protestantism was uneasy at first, but was solidified in the defeat of the Spanish Armada under Queen Elizabeth I. The defeat of Spain, which was the world's only superpower at the time, was a great source of national pride and prestige. The simultaneous writing of William Shakespeare's plays and poems strengthened the nascent English literary tradition that had begun with Geoffrey Chaucer 200 years earlier. Meanwhile, a select group of prosperous English farmers, the yeomen, began pushing for the same rights and privileges of English liberty as their noble overlords enjoyed. England's feeling of separation from continental Europe was encouraged by the gradual growth of its mercantile power and its empire in North America. Ireland's own attachment to Rome was, was threatened by English invasion and Anglo-Scottish settlement. Scotland's traditional alliance to the French was ended when the Scottish king ascended to the English throne in 1603. The Stuart dynasty of kings believed in such continental principles as the absolute right of the monarch to rule however they wished, which contrasted with the stipulations of the Magna Carta and the ambitions of the yeomanry. The English yeomen and the rich merchants, both predominantly Protestant or Anglican groups, declared war on King Charles I and defeated the king, executing him. The English Parliament and its dictator, Oliver Cromwell, now ran the country, giving Parliament an importance that it lacked elsewhere in Europe. Cromwell further strengthened the English navy and extended the empire both in Ireland and in the Caribbean. Britain's monarchy was restored with reduced power, but the primacy of Parliament in the country was entrenched. The UK dabbled in European affairs, normally to thwart the ambitions of France and Spain, but mostly concentrated, concentrated on building its colonial possessions, a strategy which paid off in the victorious Seven Years' War. Britain's immense wealth and isolation allowed it to bankroll the wars against Napoleon without ever being invaded itself. At the Battle of Trafalgar, Napoleon's ambition to build up a fleet capable of challenging the British and facilitating an invasion was shattered. Indeed, the fact that Britain was never conquered by French revolutionary forces meant that Napoleonic institutions, most notably the Napoleonic Code, never reached the island. British law would continue to uphold medieval principles such as common law, which were wiped out from the continent. British philosophy and the British universities also largely developed on their own lines. During the 19th century, the UK was undoubtedly the most powerful country in the world. Proud from its victory over Napoleon, the British establishment declared a policy of splendid isolation from the politics of the continent, retreating in on itself and refusing to get involved. On the island itself, 
the rapid advancement of technology and the infrastructural feats of the time generated considerable pride. The Victorian middle class became very patriotic and lectured the working class in the proper ways in how to act British, or even just how to act English. Public schools created a proud elite who manned a number of positions in the ever-expanding empire. Children were taught at school which part of the world were theirs, as well as good manners and etiquette to behave as British as possible in both life and in the sporting arena. The British, however, grew increasingly anxious at losing their dominant role in the world, as Germany and the US increasingly caught up with, and then overtook, British industrial production. It was these fears that caused the country to become once more entangled in European alliances, joining the First World War to fight, again, uh, sorry, to fight alongside France and Russia. During this war, the might of the empire was shown, as it was able to slowly squeeze Germany and Germany's allies into a hungry submission. The war encouraged patriotic fervour, and the British Empire emerged in 1920 bigger than ever before. However, the high financial cost incurred by the war, and the devastation it caused to Europe, meant that it was difficult for Britain to return to splendid isolation. Instead, the country was forced to play an active international role during the 1920s as part of the League of Nations, and work with France to keep Germany from returning as a power. In the 1930s, however, the economic crisis saw the UK once more withdraw from a position of world leadership and protect its own national interests. When Germany, under Hitler, took a series of aggressive steps towards war, Britain did nothing for fear of initiating a conflict that would kill even more British subjects than the First World War had done. Finally, in 1939, the UK made a stand against Hitler and declared war. The Second World War was not greeted with the enthusiasm of the First. Nonetheless, the experience of fighting against Hitler and a Europe seemingly united under the Nazis helped to unify British society and revive a sense of nationalism, especially during the period of 1940-41 to when Britain carried the brunt of the war with Germany and the brunt of the German bombing attacks. In the end, the Second World War came to be seen by many Britons, to quote Churchill, as their finest hour and as a good war to stop a great evil. Many, many people today look back with envy at the unity shown at the time, as well as the sense of having a cause to fight for. After the war, the creation of a socialised national health service and the nationalisation by the government of many British industries tied the working class into a national project and identity. In the 1950s, with the economy booming, the British saw little need to join in the united Europe that was developing on the continent. It was still possible to drive a British car to a British factory or shipyard. Increasingly, however, the British infrastructure built during the 19th century was falling apart, whilst the nationalisation of useless industries was causing massive inflation. The government attempted to end its economic woes by joining the European community. After twice being rejected for being too close to the USA, Britain was eventually able to join in 1973, a decision confirmed in a popular referendum two years later. Even as part of this European community, however, the economy continued to crash, and the 1970s were a hard time of unemployment and strife. Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister in 1979, and attempted to restore the British economy by selling off government assets and by deregulating the economy. She succeeded at the cost of destroying much of Britain's industry and millions of jobs, especially in the north of the country. Britain's wealth now relied mostly on financial services and fragile banking institutions. Meanwhile, victory in the Falklands War strengthened British pride, as did Thatcher's continuous bossing around of her fellow Europeans. In the 1990s, anti-European sentiment rose after the European community 
became the more cohesive European Union in 1993, an act which saw many British people worried that their sovereign rights would be taken away. Activists prevented Britain joining the European currency, the euro, and pushed for further and further concessions. Whilst small at first, the European, the United Kingdom Independence Party, UKIP, received a swell of support, largely due to immigration concerns once Poland joined the EU and thousands of Polish people travelled to the UK to find work. In 2016, these tensions reached their height when Britain held a referendum on its membership of the EU and voted to leave. The British were not just voting against immigrants, they were attempting to recreate the golden age of the 1950s, or the Second World War, or even the Victorian times, when the UK was able to exist in splendid isolation, and was supposedly free to run itself. However, historical tensions in Northern Ireland and in Scotland, both of which had majorities in favour of remaining in the EU, meant that the UK faced a series of new challenges in its negotiations on a post-Brexit settlement. As of December 2020, these challenges have not been solved. The final status of the Irish border or Scottish independence from Westminster are likely to be issues that feature prominently in the 2020s. Meanwhile, the British economy, already suffering from Covid, is poised to crash even further once Britain fully leaves the EU. What happens after that is anyone's guess. So thank you for uh, sticking around for all these mini lectures during the course. I hope they have been illuminating and have helped to highlight a lot of areas not covered or discussed so much in the textbook. Uh, good luck with your final projects and I can't wait to read them over. Thank you.